So today we'll do part two of the urogenital system, where we'll actually talk about the genital part of it. So the genital part of the urogenital system actually refers to the reproductive system. So the reproductive system um, is the urogenital, the genital part, um, and people talk about genitals, you know, it's kind of a weird word to use. Um, so you know that your reproductive systems are different from males and females, um, and that is in both structure and function. So in males, the goal of the reproductive system is to produce sperm and to deliver sperm. So they just need to make their sperm and they need to deliver their sperm. In females, the goal is to produce ova, and ova is just our fancy science word for eggs. So they need to produce the ova or the eggs. They need to prepare the body for the embryo, so get the body ready for this fertilized egg. And then they also need to nourish and care for the embryo. So they actually need to grow the organism once fertilization has occurred. So again, in boys, the males, they need to um, produce the sperm, deliver the sperm. Females need to produce the eggs. They need to prep the body for a fertilized egg. And then assuming an egg gets fertilized, they actually need to um, nourish it and care for it until it is a viable baby that can be born. So we'll start with the male reproductive system and we'll start with the really uncomfortable photo. I tried to find the most uh, benign photo or I mean I guess drawing that I could for you guys. Um, and that was the part where I say a bunch of words that are going to make you feel really uncomfortable. Um, so the scrotum is the external sac that holds the testes. Um, so it's this pouch of skin, so to speak, uh, that's going to hold the testes in there. And the reason that the testes need to be outside the body is so that the sperm can stay at a slightly lower temperature than body temperature. So sperm can't get too warm. If they get too warm, they're going to die. Um, sometimes if men go in for fertility testing, if a man and a woman are, you know, trying to have a baby and they can't have the baby and they're having trouble, the first thing the doctor is going to tell them to do is if you're wearing tidy whities you need to switch over to boxers because the tidy whities are holding the boys up too close to the body. It's keeping the boys too warm and then the sperm are dying off. So if you start wearing boxers, then the boys can hang a little looser. They can cool off. The sperm can cool off and then they're going to be more viable and they're going to be able to get to the egg and you're going to be able to get your partner um, pregnant, assuming that that is the plan and that is what you want to have happen. Um, Sperm are produced in the testes. So um, this little gland right here is the testis and that's where the sperm are produced. From there, they're gonna move to the epididymis. And in the epididymis, the sperm are going to be stored. So just a quick distinction. This is a testis. This whole thing is a testicle. This is a testis. This whole thing is a testicle. So from there, from the epididymis, the sperm are going to move into a tube called the vas deferens. And the vas deferens is the tube that's going to go from the testis. It's going to go up all the way around. And it's going to get to the urethra. And from the urethra, out through the penis. Okay? So again, sperm are produced in the testis. They're stored in the epididymis. They go out through the urethra, or sorry, out through the vas deferens to the urethra and from the urethra out of the body through the penis. The male urethra is shared for the transport of both urine and sperm. So both of them are going to go out at the same time. S not at the same time, sorry, from the same place. Um, seminal fluid is produced in the glands nearby. So there are multiple glands there that are going to contribute to seminal fluid. There's the prostate gland. Uh, there are seminal vesicles. There's a gland called the bulbal urethral gland. Um, and that they're going to create the seminal fluid because that's going to feed and protect the sperm. So it's a really highly sugary substance because sperm are doing a lot of movement. So they need a lot of sugar because they need a lot of energy. And so if you take a second and you think about sperm, um, you've got this head, you've got a piece called the mid piece, and then you've got the tail. So the tail is basically just a really big flagellum, okay? So the flagella is going to help, the flagellum is going to help the sperm swim. The head part contains DNA, so this is just DNA storage. And then you've got the mid piece. Now, given how much swimming this sperm has to do in order to do its job, what organelle do you think there are a lot of in the mid piece of that sperm? Come on, you got to try. 
Okay, hopefully you said mitochondria. There are lots of mitochondria in the midpiece of the sperm. And that should make sense to you because if the seminal fluid has lots of sugar, this sperm is gonna have to do some converting of that sugar into energy. And it's the mitochondria that are gonna do that. So you've got the DNA stored in the head, you've got mitochondria in the midpiece, and then you've got the flagellum that's gonna help it swim. And so the mitochondria are providing the ATP that's gonna help the flagellum go back and forth. So just one more time, semen is the combination of sperm and seminal fluid. So just like we said, blood has the red blood cells and the plasma, semen has the sperm and the seminal fluid. So <clears throat> before you probably thought semen and sperm were the same thing, but they're not. There's this fluid, seminal fluid, and then you've got the sperm cells floating around in there, swimming around in there too. There are about 2,500,000 sperm in a single drop of semen. 2,500,000 sperm in a single drop of semen. That's insane. That should give you an idea of how teeny tiny these little guys are. So the female reproductive system then. A female is born with these immature eggs that are called primary follicles. And I just want to emphasize for you, she is born with them. So a woman is born with all of the eggs she's going to have. A woman's not making eggs throughout her lifetime. She's born with them. So those eggs, those well, they're primary follicles. They're like pre-eggs. Those pre-eggs were in her body. Those were formed in her body when she was in utero. So when she was developing as an infant, as a fetus in the uterus, that's when her eggs were developing. After that, there are no more. They'll they'll get older, they'll develop, but that's why women over 35 are at a greater risk of having babies with birth defects. Because the fact of the matter is, they just have old eggs. Women over 35 just have eggs that have been hanging around for a really long time. And the older your eggs get, the greater a chance there is that there's going to be some sort of genetic abnormality that something's going to have happen. So every month, one primary follicle is going to mature into an egg. So the pre-egg is going to become a full-on egg. Ovulation is the process of that mature egg being released from the ovary. And it's a lot like exocytosis. It works a lot like exocytosis. Um, except, look at this. This is disgusting and awesome at the same time. Um, so yeah, so here's the ovary. Here's the side of the ovary. And then here is the mature egg getting kind of shot out of the ovary, being released from the ovary. The egg is going to come out of the ovary, and it's going to go into the fallopian tube. But here's what's crazy. When the egg comes out of the ovary, there's actually this little bit of space here. And it's not a lot, but there's a tiny amount of space where if the egg wanted to go rogue, I guess it could. I don't know what would happen if it did. Um, but the egg could go rogue, and it could leave. Um, except it goes into the fallopian tube. Now the end of the fallopian tube um, has these little almost like fingers and they work kind of like cilia and they're like, come to us little egg, come to us. And they help kind of bring the egg in. So that little space is fairly inconsequential because those fingers on the fallopian tubes bring the egg in. Inside the fallopian tubes though, there are actual cilia and the actual cilia go, go this way egg go this way and they sway the egg and move the egg down through the fallopian tubes and so there are cilia you can't see them in this diagram which is why i had to put them in this diagram um, but you can see that there are there are cilia that are like go this way go this way and they help keep the egg going in the right direction if the egg is going to be fertilized it's going to happen in the fallopian tube so fertilization actually happens in the fallopian tube so the sperm then, if you think about what you know about the structure of the female reproductive system, the sperm have to make it through the vagina, past the cervix, up into the uterus, and then to the fallopian tubes. And they've got to make a decision about which way they want to go. Now it's not really a decision, they just kind of keep going wherever they go. Um, and the sperm, some of the sperm are going to go into the wrong fallopian tube, and some of them are going to go into the fallopian tube that actually has the egg. So. Um, one sperm might break through and fertilize the egg. And if it does, 
then that's it. Everybody else is done. They're out of luck. Um, but that fertilization is going to happen in the fallopian tube. So if fertilization is taking place, it's happening in the fallopian tube. Whether it's fertilized or unfertilized, the egg is going to move to the uterus. So here was the ovary. The egg went into the fallopian tube. It might get fertilized. It might not get fertilized. But then it's going to move through the fallopian tube and it's going to get to the uterus. If fertilization has occurred, then the egg is going to stick to the lining of the, of the uterus. And that lining of the uterus is called the endometrium. So two things. <clears throat> Sometimes the egg doesn't move. Sometimes the egg gets fertilized and it gets stuck in the fallopian tube. So for whatever reason, the fertilized egg is in the fallopian tube. If that fertilized egg continues to reproduce, which it will, it'll become two cells and four cells and eight cells and 16 cells. That's what we call an ectopic pregnancy. So if you've ever heard of anyone having an ectopic pregnancy, that means that the pregnancy has happened and stayed in the fallopian tubes. That's bad. You can't have a baby growing in your fallopian tubes. Um, again, think about the size of the fallopian tubes in the pig. That's not going to work. Okay. Um, so then surgically they have to go in and they have to remove that pregnancy. Um, some people have, uh, some women have something called endometriosis. Endometriosis is a problem with the endometrial lining building up inside the uterus and all kinds of various things can happen there. Um, but it's a pretty painful disorder that people have. So assuming things are normal, the fertilized egg is going to implant itself in the endometrium of the uterus. If fertilization has not occurred, both the egg and the lining are going to be released in menstruation. The outer end of the uterus is called the cervix, and that's going to lead to the vagina, and that's going to lead to the outside of the body. So you could have an unfertilized egg and the endometrium that are going to come out past the cervix and out the vagina, or you could have a baby that grows inside the uterus and then eventually the baby is going to go ha have to go past the cervix and out through the vagina. And that's it. That's what you need to know about the reproductive system so far. You might have questions. If you do, write them down and I'll answer them for you the next time we talk.